I am just so pleased to have um, Bob and Johanna with us today, uh, who are wonderful friends of Olana, um, who participate with us in so many ways, uh, and um, also some of the most amazing communicators in terms of conveying their scientific knowledge and expertise to the general public. Um, I have been on Bob's tour, I think a couple of years that he has done at Olana um, on its geology and it is riveting. It is a incredible kind of um, entertainment as well as, uh, uh, it, as education. Uh, and so, I'm so happy they agreed to do this with us today and uh, talk to us about the geological history of Olana. So Bob and Johanna, you can appear. And I will disappear for the time being. And uh, so we've got you there. Great, I'm gonna stop my video. You're on. Thank you, Sean. And let us get... We're going to be there in just one second, we hope. Oh, we got to do share. it here. Share, share, share. Yep. There we go. I think okay. we got it. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. And my husband and I write for a number of regional magazines and newspapers around the Catskills. We also written two books about the Ice Age. And we currently have an article in the June issue of Fine Arts Connoisseur Magazine. And as Sean said, we are active members of Olana and of Cedar Grove also. But he's a geologist and I'm a biologist. We are definitely not art historians. Although the two of us have studied, long studied the Ice Age history of the Catskills and the Hudson Valley and greatly admire the work of the artists of the Hudson River School. Um, we believe that all the landscapes our Hudson Valley artists painted are products of Ice Age processes. And so today our goal is to illustrate this, to bring our geologic perspective to you. To describe what you see, what we see, and what you hopefully will see when we look out from Olana. And that's why we call them our unplanned views. So we'd first like to recognize for a minute that we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the efforts of probably hundreds of people to restore and preserve this extraordinary place. When the two of us began visiting Olana some 20 years ago now, the grounds were overgrown and the landscape so beautifully sculpted by Frederick Church was fast returning to a wild state. So we're truly grateful that for all that has been done to allow visitors from literally all over the world to see what many consider church's greatest work of art, the landscape of Olana. The view that has been on the screen is a planned view of, from, of Olana from church's lake down below. The Hudson Valley can rightfully be called the cradle of American landscape architecture. Names like Calvert Fox and his partner, Andrew Jackson Downing, considered to be the founder of landscape architecture, and Frederick Law Olmsted, Alexander Jackson Davis, all loom large in the early history of this art, and they all worked here in the Hudson Valley. Olana's 250 acres provided church numerous opportunities to create landscape architecture. He planted trees here, he cut trees there. He manicured and shaped his grounds to open areas of interest in scenic views and frame them with artistic effect. The long drive to his beautiful home was sculpted and manipulated at every turn to offer guests spectacular imagery. Yet it was the natural beauty of Churchill and its surroundings, its view shed, that provided church with the canvas he worked upon. The vista is typical 
of a church planned view. It shows a view of Crown Hill and just south of the mansion, and it has been recently restored. Next is a planned view from along the driveway below Olana. And this one is a view from the south porch and is perhaps the finest example of church's planned views. We greatly appreciate what church did here, but we see something else. We have long been studying the geological history of Olana, and we've come to understand that before church did any of this landscape architecture, it was the glaciers of the Ice Age that sculpted Churchill. So today we would like to take you for a tour of several of Church's plus best plant views and describe their Ice Age history. We want you to understand how glaciers sculpted the grounds of Olana long before Church came along. So Robert's going to take us to the next planned view. It's known as the North Meadow. And this is the North Meadow. If you haven't been there, you just walk a little bit north of Olana itself. Soon uh, you're there. Uh, this is a work of art. You're looking at a Frederick Church original. Uh, this is what he designed. This is what he wanted us to see. I think he'd be very happy to know that in the year 2020, you could go see what he had imagined for this location. And it's a work of art that you own. You can go there <laughs> anytime you want and take a look at your piece of Frederick Church art. But we want to take you back in time. We want to go back about 25,000 years. When, and this site existed 25,000 years ago, but it was uh, different. There would have been a forest here. Some people call them virgin forests. Some people call them old growth forests. These would have been nat a natural forest, uh, the product of literally thousands of years of growth from the top of Church Hill to all the way down at the bottom of the Hudson Valley. There was this marvelous uh, forest of tall trees growing. It was a mixture. Uh, there were a large number of hardwoods. You could have expected to see oak. You would have seen maple and you would have seen chestnut. You would have seen a lot of chestnut. Oh, we wish we could go see a chestnut forest nowadays. There were also softwood trees, pines, hemlocks, spruce, all growing to great marvelous sizes. Now, suppose instead of being given three score and 10, you were given 700 years, or perhaps even better, 1700 years. Yes, you spent the decades and then centuries living here on Church Hill, you would begin to feel that things were changing. Uh, it would be hard to notice exactly if you kept good notes, uh, though, however, you could have demonstrated those changes. You would find that indeed uh, the climate was getting cooler and then colder. But there were things that you would have noticed. Uh, the oak, the maple, the chestnuts were disappearing. At the same time, the pines, the hemlocks, and the spruce were taking over. What I'm saying is that if a maple died, there's a real good chance that it would have been replaced by a spruce uh, tree. Nature was reacting to climatic changes that were going on, but it was just a, fi a quick fix and it would fail. Nature would not succeed in overcoming the climatic changes that were going on. Winters weren't much colder uh, back then, but they became snowier and snowier. It just snowed a lot. It was the summers that saw the, uh, witnessed the biggest changes. The summers first got cooler and then they got colder, especially late in the season. August should be such a wonderful and warm month. It stopped being that. The growing seasons shortened. Things were going on. Decades and then centuries passed and these patterns were not reversed. In fact, the uh, deterioration of the climate accelerated. 
warm climate plants and animals, and especially warm climate birds, were disappearing from Church Hill. Cold climate plants and animals, and especially cold climate birds, were becoming more and more abundant at the top, especially the top of Church Hill. And then it was just a fundamentally different sort of climate, a kind of climate that you and I don't experience during our lifetimes today. There would be four, five, six, even seven days in a row when uh, there were beautiful, clear azure skies where you could, from morning to night, gaze into the sky and not see a single cloud anywhere. And at night, the stars would not be blotted out by clouds as well. Then there was something else. You'd hold your hand up to the northeast, and you would feel, day and night, a steady, cold, extremely dry wind, always blowing from the same direction, always blowing out of the northeast very uncomfortable wind. The back of your nose would start to dry out. You would have a hard time. You would look in that direction. You would stand there at uh, the North Meadow, what would be the North Meadow, look to the Northeast, hold your hand up, feel the wind, and you would say, you know what I think? I think there's something out there. And I think it is cold, and I think it is dry. And you wouldn't know what it was. You'd have no idea what was going on. The winters began to become snow, so very snowy that it began to affect the trees the following summer. Uh, they wouldn't blossom until later in the spring. They would never quite become what the trees should become. Uh, and the trees uh, on top uh, Church Hill began to actually sit and die. Eventually, there was a summer so cold that the snow did not all melt. Uh, at the end of August and early September, the shadowed area of Church Hill still had snow lying, dirty snow, but still had snow lying upon them. At that point, uh, there was a summer when the ground didn't all thaw out, when the ground became permanently frozen. That was the summer when the last tree died atop Church Hill. Now, birds and animals can move south. They can migrate. And if they do so, they'll be all right. But trees can't go anywhere. And for all practical purposes, insects cannot travel either. Those two categories of life could not escape. Gradually, Church Hill developed a dense stand of gray, dead, trees. And that all replaced the beautiful green forest that had been right here. Church Hill became a forest of the dead. Now, a tree doesn't make any noise. On a windy day, sure, it kind of makes some noise, but a, a tree doesn't itself make noise. With the death of the forest, the forest fell silent. There were no birds, there were no insects, there were no grunting animals. And on a still day, when there was no wind, the forest was just as unearthly silent as can possibly be imagined. But there weren't very many days like that. Remember that wind blowing out of the Northeast? It continues. It's dry, it's cold, and it's turning those old dead trees into dry, dead, old trees. On a breezy day, the wind would blow out of the northeast and twigs would be ripped from the dead trees and brought to the ground. On even windier days, some of the branches that remained would be splintered off of the tree and would fall to the ground. On very, very windy days, the limbs themselves of the dead old trees were ripped from the trunks and fell to the ground. There must have developed a time when if you stood here at what's today the North Meadow and turned 360 degrees, you would have seen nothing but dead tree trunks all year round. Now, year after year after year, the snow is intensifying and year after year after year, less and less of it is melting in the summer. 
Now the Hudson Valley is beginning to fill with snow. Church Hill is piling high with snow as well. It's succumbing to a fate which has already befallen all of the landscape to the north. You wouldn't have to travel very far to the north to find a densely snowed in landscape. There was a day when if you stood right here where this picture was taken and gazed off a little bit to the north past uh, Mount Marino in the distance, you would have seen something that you had never seen before. If you got up early in the morning, it would be purple. As the hours ticked away, it would turn blue and then green. By 11 o'clock, it would be yellow. At noon, it would be a brilliant diamond white. In the afternoon, all the colors would be reversed. The white would turn yellow and then green and then blue and purple. And whatever that entity was, just there, a little bit to the right of Mount Marino, it would disappear into the darkness. Day after day, month after month, even year after year, you would look north past Mount Marino and you couldn't tell what it was, but you could tell that it was moving south. It was drawing closer and closer and closer. As it approached, and its image became sharper, there would have been a moment standing right here uh, where this picture was taken, you would have gazed to the north and you would have seen that entity, that thing clearly enough so that you would have instantaneously recognized it for what it was. It was a glacier. And now all of the mysteries that have been presented to us, all of the questions that we have asked have suddenly, abruptly, in an instant, be answered. We have been watching our entry into an ice age. The glacier draws even closer. Here and there, it's pushed forward by the ice moving behind it. When it gets close enough, you begin to perceive that it is bulldozing over the old dead tree trunks. Well, uh, at this point, it would be only instinctive for us to back up a little bit and to look south for an escape. But then suddenly, we look to our right to where the Taconic Mountains are, and it all gets worse. Rising above the Hudson Valley Glacier that we have been rising, watching is something called an ice sheet, something called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. It extends from here all the way back to Labrador. Suddenly we look to the left and coming down across the Hudson Valley Glacier and across the Adirondacks and approaching the Catskills is more of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Nothing is going to stop it. It is, its advance to the south seems inevitable. Churchill is not the goal of this glacier. Churchill is not a place where the ice will stop. It's going to pass across Churchill it's going to continue to the south. It will not stop until it gets to what we call today New York City. It will not stop until it gets to what we call Long Island. We're left here on top Church Hill at the bottom of the glacier. It is cold, extremely cold. It is very dark. It is black. And we can't see anything but we can hear and we hear the sound of this moving glacier grinding across Church Hill and shaping it into the Church Hill that Frederick Church they would arrive at and do his landscape. Take a look at this LIDAR image uh, of Mount Marino and Church Hill. LIDAR imaging is the result of using pulsing lasers to remotely measure the distance from a fixed point, sometimes in space, uh, to the Earth's surface. It produces images of only the surface of the Earth, effectively removing all the other objects like trees and buildings. Now let's have Robert talk about the view from the south porch of Olana. 
an even earlier chapter of the Ice Age. And, but first, that is Mount Marino. The mouse is showing you Mount Marino. And this is Church Hill to the south. Both so very nicely sculpted. This is the big view. This is the best one. Uh, this is the view from the south porch of Olana. And uh, uh, it was never let to overgrow. Uh, it was always kept clear. Uh, you could always gaze uh, to the south and see uh, this uh, plan view. You can't miss it. If you've not been there, this is something you absolutely have to see. And you have to spend an hour or two. You have to visit at different times of the day and different times of the uh, year. But we're going to take you into the past. We're going to stand here and travel into the past. We're going to go back to September 3rd, 155,892 years BC, the middle of the afternoon. This is an old glaciation. Uh, it's an older glaciation than the one I just spoke of. It's called the Illinoisan glaciation. We've arrived on a typical September afternoon during the Illinoisan glaciation. There is a vast, enormous, great high pressure system uh, centered on the North Pole and spreading out to the south, down to Olana, and uh, across the North Pole and on into Scandinavia. There is that relentless uh, dry, cold wind blowing out of the high pressure system and across uh, Olana. Now, earlier in the day, it had been worse, in fact, quite a bit worse. Had you stood here just three hours earlier, seven, eight in the morning, uh, blowing snow was so dense that you had no view of anything. You couldn't have seen anything that you see in that image. Uh, but things are starting to settle down. The wind is starting to slow down. Uh, we can gaze across the Hudson Valley now, and in the far distance, we can see the Catskill Mountains for the first time uh, since we've arrived. Way out there, uh, the wind is blowing uh, against the quote, shores of the Catskill Mountains and wispy banks, wispy waves of snow are blowing up against the lower levels of the Catskill Mountains. Above that snow, uh, there's bare bedrock. Uh, at first, there are horizons of brown sandstone and then above that, red sandstone. It's a beautiful sight, uh, but it's just bare bedrock. Uh, there's no green in this image from 155,000 years ago. There's no foliage out there. There is no forest. These are not the Catskill Mountains that we know today. Now, we cast a view downwards and below those snowbanks, we see the Hudson Valley itself, and it's filled with ice. It's filled with a glacier that we call the Hudson Valley Glacier. We gaze to the north, and that glacier is densely and thickly blanketed in last winter's snowfall. Now we gaze to the south, and the summer, which is just coming to an end this September day, has warmed up the snow enough to melt it, and the Hudson Valley Glacier is exposed. It's raw glacial ice. It's dirty. Uh, it's not white. It's a, a lot of earth has been exposed by the melting. It's a rough looking ice, and especially because enormous crevasses have opened up within that part of the glacier. They spread out across the entire Hudson Valley uh, from here in the west to there in the east. They're curved, and these crevasses betray the fact that this glacier is in motion. Not that you can see it moving, you, you can't, not whatsoever, but this glacier has been and is and will be for quite some time moving down. 
the uh, Hudson River Valley and creating those crevasses. Now, this is where uh, Frederick Church's planned view comes in. The Hudson Valley Glacier is an icy machine of erosion. It's carving, it's rubbing up against the wall of Manitou. That's the eastern front of the Catskill Mountains. The glacier is rubbing up against this, the wall of Manitou, and it, its erosion is steepening the wall of Manitou, and the, its erosion is straightening the wall of Manitou and creating what is going to be the centerpiece of Frederick Church's planned view from the south porch. Now, there are a couple of things missing. As we gaze out 155,000 years ago, we see there is no Catterskill Clove, nor is there a Platykill Clove. Those two canyons are going to form later on in time. When the snow and the ice wall does finally melt, vast quantities of meltwater will come pouring out of the Catskill Mountains and will carve. They will carve these two great canyons. We stand still so many thousands of years ago on what will be the south porch of Olana, and twilight arrives, and then the evening arrives, and then it darkens. And as it darkens, as the sky becomes pure black, something marvelous happens. An aurora borealis appears, something Frederick Church would have very much. Ice Age created the Catskill Front, as you just heard, a critical part of the planned view from the South Porch. In this LIDAR image, we can see the Catskill Front and its sculpted appearance. Now we come to the recently restored bridge overlook. Another planned view, although the bridge did not exist when Frederick Church created the view, the boulder in the middle is called the glacial erratic. It was carried here by that ice sheet and left behind when the ice melted back. But there is so much more here. We are going to take you, this is another one of those works of art uh, that had been left to overgrow. It was only not many years ago that this was cleared and this field was opened up so that you could travel here and walk out upon it and see the view, the planned view that Frederick Church had in mind. Oh, in the 1870s, I think. But our job is not to take you to see a planned view. Our job is to take you to see that unplanned view. We're gonna travel back through time once again, and we're gonna, after our travel, arrive to June 7th, oh, let's make it June 10th. 13,505 years BC, just a little bit before dawn. And we're standing right there uh, in what will be Frederick Church's field. We turn and we look to the east and we look high up into the sky. Immediately above us, uh, it's still kind of dark, it's still kind of night, and the sky is a very dark blue. We crane our neck, we look further and further to the east, downwards and to the east. And that dark blue sky becomes a blue sky and then a cream colored sky. The typical colors of an oncoming mortar morning. Now we turn around, we walk to the edge of this field and we look down into the Hudson Valley below us. As it was 13,500 years ago, right at the valley stretching uh, just north of the bridge is the Hudson River uh, va uh, Glacier as it was on that morning. It moved in from the right, from the north. It got as far as where the bridge is uh, today and it came to a halt at that spot. We gaze at the glacier that's down there the top of the glacier is an icy white. It's blanketed in snow, as is so often the case. It's broken again by blue crevasses, 
uh, fractures, but these are fractures of the ice uh, that run north to south. They're recent fractures. They have little to do with the movement of that uh, glacier. Below the front of the ice, it disappears into a darkness. Now we stand for an hour or two and we watch as the eastern sky begins to brighten. And as enough light gets into the Hudson Valley below us, we suddenly see that spread out south of the glacier is an ice age lake. It's called Glacial Lake Albany. And it extends down the Hudson Valley all the way to what someday will become New York City. The lake is covered with ice, and the ice is covered with snow. And the snow is blowing around a little bit. That's not such a big surprise, is it? There is one break in the white uh, covering blanketing the lake. There is a channel of water. Uh, the glacier has been melting. Water has been pouring out of it. And the flowing current of water coming out of the glacier has melted through the ice and through the snow to create a jet black channel running off to the south. We've arrived at a morning where there isn't much wind. It's absolutely still. Obviously, there are no birds, there are no insects in this Ice Age landscape. It should be absolutely silent, but it is not. We hear a groaning sound. We hear a grinding sound. And every once in a while, an ear-splitting, cracking sound. The glacier is not only in motion, but the glacier is fracturing. Uh, it's mobile, it's moving, it's brittle ice, and it doesn't hold up well under the effects of movement. The Hudson Valley Glacier is advancing down the Hudson Valley. Now, recent winters have been quite mild, and uh, there's been a lot of snowfall back to the north, all the way back to, uh, all the way back to Labrador. That snow has been pressing down upon the Laurentide Ice Sheet and driving the ice to the south. Uh, pushing it to the south. To make things worse, the warm winters that we've been experienced have caused melting underneath the Hudson River Valley Glacier. And it's wet down there. The glacier pushed from behind and riding across a film of water has been what we call hydroplaning. It's been moving as fast as a glacier can move in a southerly direction. And uh, uh, we call that a surging glacier. Can you imagine such a thing as a surging glacier? If we stand here for hours and watch the glacier below us, we will perceive that it's moving and it's advancing to the south at about 90 meters per day. In English, or better in American, it's moving south the length of a single football field per day. It's rubbing up against Church Hill and it's eroding Church Hill. It's doing here what an earlier glacier did across the valley to the Catskill Mountains. It is eroding uh, Church Hill and creating the steep slope that Frederick Church will turn into this planned view. We stand for an hour or two gazing down at the glacier and we see that not only is the glacier melting, but it is, we can say, fairly disintegrating. It has been so warm that the, uh, that the ice has been melting so much that it's getting ready to let go. Suddenly, the whole front of the glacier collapses. A great mass of ice plunges into Lake Albany, crashes down into the lake. The buoyancy of the ice brings it back to the surface and erupts out of the surface, it goes down and up and down and up several more times. A great wave, a single wave, radiates out from this collapsing ice down the Lake Albany Valley. A series of crescentic fractures open up as the wave passes by and geysers of water erupt at each fracture. 
the lake is an awful mess. We've been privileged to see the origin of this planned view, which is visible in this drawing. Well, that was Church's planned view of the steep overlook that was a product of the erosion of a glacier. Now, we often get to leave people with a mystery, a glimpse into a facet of a place that few people know about. And as far as we know, has been lost, uh, perhaps never to be found again. At Alana, that mystery is directly connected to the Ice Age. Henry Fairfield Osborne, renowned scientist and family friend of the churches, published an account in a January 1900 issue of the American Naturalist Journal about a pothole on the grounds of Frederick Church's estate. The pothole was ex excavated some years before his report, and it measured 25 feet deep by eight feet in diameter. It was described as being at the base of a 65 foot cliff of shale and was found while quarrying for road metal to fill the roads leading up to Alana. It goes on to describe how it was formed by glacial meltwater running off the cliff, but says really little else about it. There's one more short account that tells us that it was at an elevation of approximately 400 feet above sea level. And a letter written by Frederick Church also says that he had been informed that, was, that he was the proud owner of a hole in the ground. We don't know if the pothole was destroyed or filled in or is still waiting for someone to find. So perhaps you'll come across it someday when you're strolling the grounds. We hope that you've enjoyed our short visit to the grounds of Alana and that you will discover for yourself what we have seen on our own journeys to Alana and that you may come to look at the Catskills and the greater Hudson Valley as we do, as a gift of the Ice Age. Thanks for being with us. And we have time for questions. Hello, thank you, Bob and Johanna. That was fascinating. I, I, I just am so riveted by the idea of this incredible range of time and of the activity of millennia, you know, in, in the site. And uh, um, so thank you, really appreciate um, hearing uh, this um, it, from uh, this point of view. And I think it's one, as I, sh as I said, when we, we first got on to say hello this afternoon, that I think Church would particularly have been just so fascinated by having the strong, strong interest in science, the natural sciences, geology, optics, all of these things that came into play today. Uh, Bob, your optic, uh, description of the light refracting through the ice I, that was that was right out of church's uh, uh, paint box I think but uh, um, so I have an, a few questions but I just want to encourage people to put questions into the Q&A good I see we're getting some which is great all right so I will try to get mine in just to give people a little more chance to put some more in um, I mean I've, I'm fascinated by the plateaus that you see going up to the escarpment of the Catskills from Olana. And I, I've just, I, is that sediment that creates those, that plateau, is that what that is? It's not a, a layer of rock that's carved at a different rate or something by the glacier, right? Each of those is a ledge of brown sandstone, which was deposited in a river, which descended out of the Appalachian Mountains across the great delta complex about 380 million years ago. And uh, those sandstone ledges represent moments, chapters in time 
when the Appalachian Mountains were rising at remarkable rates, eroding at equally remarkable rates and producing vast quantities of sand. Okay. Nice eye. Good eye. Good, uh, good thing to notice. Well, yeah, I, mean, I noticed when the car, you need to accelerate as you go up to Catskill <laughs> Falls. You know, there's several places there, so right. uh, good. Let's, let's get the um, uh, participants' questions in here. Um, so uh, Christine uh, Kulasek is saying, uh, I've been told the Catskill Mountains are an ancient river delta. How did this mm -hmm. delta form and what forces brought it to the surface? Well, I'd like, uh, when you get a chance, Christine, right? Uh, look up uh, Google Bangladesh and Max, uh, and eventually, it won't take long, you'll find a nice satellite image of the uh, Himalaya Mountains with Bangladesh spread out in front of those mountains. Bangladesh essentially is a great river delta. Uh, and uh, the Ganges River Delta, the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, where do I know my ge geography, and spread out in front of a rising mountain range. Now take that picture and uh, turn it 90 degrees and you'll understand what was going on here in the Northeast during the Devonian time period, uh, 380 million years ago, when, like the Himalayas, the Appalachians were actively rising, and like Bangladesh, the Catskill vicinity was a great river delta. It's a vivid image that you'll get, and a very, uh, very valuable lesson on what our Catskill and Northeastern geology represents. Fascinating uh, thing to come to understand. Bob, in that connection, I remember standing there with you on a tour once and you're pointing to the east and talking about how, how the Taconics were such a, a vast range as well. We now mm -hmm. think of them pretty much as hills, but, you know, or and then the Berkshires beyond, right? So there's a series yeah. of these ranges, is that? Yeah. I, would that I was just going to say that the Acadian Mountains are, are basically what you're talking about, what we call the Acadian Mountains. And they were once, it's thought, almost as high as the Himalayas. And they have eroded down now, and what you see that's left are the taconics. Mm -hmm. And all of that erosion went into making the Catskill Delta. When you stand at the top Church Hill, uh, we want you to look five miles into the air, <laughs> and there you would arrive at the top huh? of the Acadian Mountains. <laughs> five miles of rock have decayed, have eroded away. Think about that. <laughs> it, it, it's 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 mind boggling. It's just fascinating. <laughs> and the way that you paint these these um, pictures with words. I mean, have you ever thought about? I mean, have there been reconstructions a la National Geographic of these kind of? I mean, has people attempted that, or is that dangerous because you <laughs> put in the, you know words are always a little bit more subject to interpretation than the, mm -hmm. the you know than seeing. Oh, and, and you have to remember, we're scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the privilege that artists have yeah. of speculating about things. But we do actively search for good artistic illustrations. Uh, you go online, you can find wonderful things. And uh, the both of us have truly appreciate the contributions that very good artists make to our science. More and more, they're making efforts to portray just the sorts of things that you're talking about. Very, very helpful to us. Well, I'm gonna jump ahead one question and we'll get back to the other question, but Nancy DeFlon says, was Church interested in the geology of the site, Alana, wondering whether he may have picked up the interest from Cole, who was well-read in geology? You wanna address that a well, little bit? Well, hi, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, I think he was. Uh, we have to, of course, go back to his uh, relationship with von Humboldt, and um, we were just talking before about the fact that he happened to be on the same boat on his way up to Newfoundland with Louis Agassiz, who is the father of Ice Age theory. So we can imagine that they had discussions about that. And there are a lot of books of scientific nature that uh, Frederick Church had in his library. And his very good friends were the Osbournes, uh, Henry Fairfield was a bit younger than him. He was actually the son of Frederick Church's friend, but 
he went on to be the director of the Museum of Natural History in New York City. So he had science surrounding him. <laughs> so we couldn't, couldn't say that yeah. he couldn't be absorbing at least some of it. Years ago, the Woodstock Land Conservancy auctioned me off and a renowned sculptor uh, won me in the auction and he had me out to his 15 acre estate in the lower Catskill Mountains because he wanted to know about the geology of his estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very much, oh God, I wish Freddie Church had won me in an auction. <laughs> <laughs> It was. And, you know, we kind of flummox people because my students especially uh, were thought that I would just do science 24-7. Mm, yeah. Until one day I told them, and I used to live in New Jersey, and that I told them that most of my weekends were spent at the Met Museum staring at the heart of the Andes. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not exaggerating. She no. <laughs> I could absorb many weekends, definitely. Yeah. 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 But that I mean the interrelationship is one that's so important, certainly for understanding church between science and, and art and the yeah. way that Humboldt called to, you know the landscape artist to action to to go capture uh what he was seeing in the unity of nature and you know in the mm -hmm. world and, and this uh, scientific awakening of the natural sciences. Um uh, a question from Deborah Truppen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, but there's a large glacial erratic in Rockefeller Preserve in Westchester. Are there any other larger ones near Olana? You showed that what is relatively oh. a smaller mm -hmm. one out on the- Where's that one that we went to, remember? That big one? Uh, oh, in Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah. Pyramid, yeah. is it? Or? Pyramid, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. The Berkshires or? We, we grew up around a really, really large erratic that's called Glen Rock. Mm -hmm. And the town that it's in is called Glen Rock. Huh. It actually splits the main street in two. And Ooh. yeah, so we've been around the- Where, where is that in Massachusetts? Well, Glen Rock, in, New Jersey. In New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, Glen Rock, New Jersey. I've heard of yeah. that, okay. I went by it every day on my paper route. <laughs> Maybe it was, a, it was an influence. <laughs> Gee, you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, but do you in the Catskills are there lots? I know up in Vermont, where I'm oh, from, the northeastern yeah. part of Vermont, there's a lot of glacial erratics in the woods when you go hiking. Um, yeah, but, all you have to do is really walk around on a trail. Boulder, okay. and you'll find. Them. Boulder. Yeah, Boulder Rock is um, just south of uh, the site of the Catskill Mountain House. Okay, there's a trail from the area of the Catskill Mountain House to Boulder Rock and that's pretty big. That's, a good one. that's the right. rock that's on the cover of our latest book. Oh great, okay I'm gonna go look for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah good. Um, and I have to ask Bob the way that you tell stories in your uh, in your you're speaking now but I imagine in your teaching as well. I mean how did that evolve? I mean was that something that you had to practice or is, have you always been <laughs> You know, I mean, no, because it's a very effective way to communicate, you know, putting people in the place. I always, I always would call it like first person geology or something, you know, I mean. I am an out and out ham. Okay, all right. <laughs> My wife will confirm Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love speaking. I genuinely love speaking uh, to work at an audience. I would have been a good stand up comic. Uh, <laughs> and I'm the straight man. She's the straight man. <laughs> Or you've got a great act. You've got a great act. Uh, well, let's see. I think that brings us almost to time. And uh, oh, happy anniversary. Yes, happy anniversary. Thank you. Today. It's our 20th. Denise Lehman wishes you a happy anniversary. Oh, oh that's our daughter. Here. Oh, okay. Very good. You have, um, you have a family in the audience. Will uh, Leland says, can you provide perhaps on the Alana website, some pointers to artists who have created images of these ancient mountains and images of some of their pictures. So I guess um, maybe looking for what I was talking about in terms of like recreation potentially, is that what I'm interpreting here? Life Magazine did a series on dinosaurs in the middle 1950s. 
and that had an enormous effect upon me. The centerpiece of these articles were foldouts, uh, uh, images of dinosaurs that were painted. And I was absolutely, truly captivated. Dinosaurs weren't available to little kids as much back then as they are today. And that was artwork that had an enormous influence upon me, uh, directed me. Uh, I'm, technically, I became a paleontologist more than a geologist, uh, but I, I, can, I can blame artists. <laughs> we, can, we can kind of push it to a, one local artist. We occasionally do talks about the first really forest ecology in the world that was right in the area of the Catskills, and that was called the Goboa Forest. And a woman named Kristen Wyckoff, mm -hmm. very, very good artist, has actually done murals inside the Gilboa Museum, which is a really cute mm -hmm. little museum that everyone should go visit. And uh, she occasionally does paintings okay. of era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which we use. She's always let us use her paintings. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, from, uh, I, you know, obviously with dinosaurs, things evolve too, right? As new discoveries, the images of them change, whether they're features mm -hmm. or things. So I imagine that must happen with geology as more things are discovered. One, you know, remeasures and, you know, recalculates what your, are clearly speculations at some level. But um, one more question from Christine Kulisek. Um, are there drumlins in our area? If so, where okay. so I can visit? Churchill is a drumlin. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, what is, <laughs> what is the drumlin? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, a Churchill is a rock drumlin. A drumlin is a hill. Most of them are made out of uh, gravel, and they've been sculpted by the passage of the glacier. Uh, we showed a picture of Mount Marino, uh, and we showed how sculpted it was. That is a rock drumlin. It has all the shape of a drumlin. Now, south from uh, Olana in Germantown, all the way down to Hyde Park, uh, there are about 180 drumlins. To Poughkeepsie. All the way to Poughkeepsie, yes. Right. That's, Poughkeepsie is built upon a drumlin. Uh, Greenville, on our side of the Hudson River, is, uh, has a series of drumlins as well. Uh, head south down, what's it, Route 9, I suppose, towards. towards uh, King, uh, towards uh, uh, Hyde Park, and almost every single hill that you'll pass is, is actually a drumlin. The best way to do it is to get a topographic map out of the same area and see the topography of the drumlins illustrated on those maps. They're nondescript little hills until you find out what they are, and they go back to the Ice Age, as so many things do. Okay, well, that's 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 amazing. So I have to ask, if you were to look at water around Olana, I look to try to find. I mean, anyway, we should talk about this offline because there's a constant <laughs> church constantly struggled with water, with good water, and mm -hmm. you know we continue to, to to this day to to have issues with that. But uh, you know, is there as does your does your scientific training and background help? in that regard, could, would you be somebody to consult for how one drills a well more effectively, one place or the other? No. No, we're not hydrogeologists. <laughs> all right, all right. You have to pay somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was worth a try. What can I say? <laughs> there's a marsh out back of, on the eastern side of uh, Church Hill, there's a marsh, which extends all the way up to the college. Right. And there's right. what's left of a lake, a glacial lake, that uh, lay up against the western side of Church Hill at the end of the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So that wet area there is really mm -hmm. also Ice Age related then. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I think that does it for the questions as far as I can scroll and see. Um, we would thank you so much again for taking time on your anniversary and happy anniversary. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon again, I hope. You will Absolutely. see us soon. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you. you.